Hello friends, I have something very different to what you're used to on this channel in this video. I was recently interviewed by the astrologer Andre Carr on his YouTube channel, which is called Astrology Alert. And we had a long but fun and really interesting conversation about world astrology, planetary cycles and the coming decade. And we got into a lot of the topics that I cover on this channel, but in a much more conversational and free-flowing way than what you usually see in my videos. And we covered a lot of ground, including geopolitics, the multipolar world, Andre Barbeau, 2026, Russian and American history, nuclear weapons, and yes, UFOs. It's not the usual kind of highly edited content that you're used to seeing here, but I thought you would find the conversation interesting. So I decided to put it out on this channel too. And don't worry, there are much more of my usual edited videos in the pipeline and heading to this channel very soon. So please don't forget to give it a like if you find it interesting. And without further ado, here goes. What I'm really focused on in, in my astrology is sort of big picture, big transits, like historical perspective and that kind of thing. Um, I am a consulting astrologer. I see clients, you know, and I, you know, do the same kind of astrology that a lot of us do. But, but what really interests me is this: this kind of the big picture and understanding history and historical processes. Mm -hmm. So, what my kind of obsession is really um, just kind of understanding where are we in history? You know, what are the processes that are are, are going on that explain why the world looks as it does right now? And right. And then also trying to maybe figure out where things are going, but obviously prediction on a, this kind of scale is is really difficult. But what I found is that um, looking at big planetary cycles, they they do um, I think enable you to do some kind of prediction because as a cycle goes on, as as um, a cycle begins at a conjunction, and then planets um, make aspects with each other. You can see what's happening at each point in a cycle mm -hmm. and you can start to get a picture of, you know, what is this cycle about? What, is, what are the big themes? Because what I've really found is that um, cycles tell stories. Mm -hmm. They um, There's a story that, you know, there's a seed at a conjunction. Some sort of story is seeded and it's not always completely obvious to to human beings what that story is, but astrology planetary cycles and a kind of and looking at history can enable us to kind of look back and say ah okay i can see what story was being told by that that cycle good point yeah those are great points i mean uh <laughs> you can think of two that come to mind immediately although i'm sure you'll be talking about this but in the saturn neptune cycle so the saturn neptune will be conjoining in 2025 20, 26 they were conjoined in the last civil war, well, the one and only civil war in the U.S., so that's something to remember. And also, I noticed, I'm pretty sure, 1917, so you could connect that to the First World War, correct? As an example of, of patterns that repeat where you think, gulp, you know, these two planets, you know, and what they might do, um, you know, a significant yeah. in conjunction, right? Yeah, 100%, right. exactly. Right. So, so... Looking back at you know what what's what have previous Saturn Neptune conjunctions done, what have we seen in the world, um, you know th that can that can tell us an awful lot. And yeah, as you say, um, those are some of the things that happened in previous Saturn Neptune conjunctions. The one that's coming in twenty twenty six looks really interesting because it's uh, it's happening in February of that year at zero degrees of Aries. This is the first degree of the entire zodiac right which symbolically is pretty interesting right it's definitely definitely yeah that's an unusual unusual degree for sure how many i wonder how many hundreds or thousands of years before you get a conjunction like that at zero aries it's probably impossible to calculate <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, so I, I made a video about this cycle last year with a, another astrologer, S.J. Anderson. We, we did a fair bit of research into this cycle and using our software, we couldn't find uh, any other conjunctions going back thousands of years at that exact degree. Oh, there there have go. been, yeah, there have been others like in very, you know, in Aries have been 
quite obviously quite a lot. And then in very early Aries, there have been some other ones, but yeah, right at that degree, you just can't find one. So it's yeah, it's kind yeah. of incredible. Yeah, this, this is probably gonna it's gonna fill the books then for the next decades because astrologers talk a lot about the zero degree point and how significant it is, and then they can refer back to this major conjunction right after after it goes through. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, very interesting, very interesting, definitely, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it's you have to wonder what what it what it might might mean um, if the if the zodiac is um, you know the story of life from kind of birth to in Aries to rejoining the 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 ocean of consciousness, say in Pisces, in Pisces, then mm -hmm. you know then the what's the first degree of Aries is surely the moment of birth if it's true if yeah. it's anything very true very true uh yeah the the only yeah aries because that that's what we're talking about now i i did notice that there was one conjunction of saturn neptune because if you look at the civil war or you look at the 17 both of those are you have to count them as negative the 1989 conjunction in capricorn you could perhaps point the other way to a certain change in governmental patterns that, at least in the near term then, appeared to be very positive. Uh, but that's Capricorn, this is Aries, so it's a totally different thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so they'll, they'll, these, these conjunctions will probably express themselves, yeah, as you say, differently in, in different signs. And Saturn-Neptune, it's a tricky, it's a tricky combination, right? Because Saturn and Neptune are two very different planets. They're almost kind of, in certain sense, they're almost opposites, really. If, Saturn is concrete and Neptune is is diffuse and sort of diffuse ineffable hard to pin down wasn't it I'm, I'm trying to remember you, you might be you might remember this uh Andre Barbeau the another astrologer who was really uh, adept at these big world cycles I think he he correlated if I'm not mistaken Saturn Neptune he thought was either either China or the Soviet Union. It was one of those two, because I'm pretty sure he had Saturn Uranus was a US uh, correlation and Saturn Pluto might have been China. Or, I can't remember which of those two, but Saturn Neptune was one of those two countries. Do you, do you recall which one it was? Yes, yes. So Saturn um, Saturn Neptune is, re is really tightly correlated with Russian history. Russian history, um, okay. There you go. Right, right, right. Yeah, see, that's fascinating. That's really fascinating because notice who's in charge there's this pre the president right now their their mob boss so to speak he is uh that's what i you know it's my my perception of russian government but he's a libra with lots of planets in libra and the conjunction is happening on the other side of that so yeah well he was if i'm not mistaken he was born at the time of the around the time of the the last uh, there were conjunctions in 1952 and 53 in libra in Libra. Putin was born. Yes, that's around, right. At that time, around that time, it's kind of interesting that um, you know that we're coming to another one of these conjunctions. It's it's really synced with Russian history because you can look at 1917. You have the Russian Revolution. You have 52. You have the death of Stalin. You have the next ones coming 89. You have Nine. the fall of the Red Wall. Exactly. Then, exactly. So you can. Add, yeah, that's a that's a great point. Yeah, that that those four right there they. They give you the arc of history for Russia, almost precisely. So maybe, maybe Andre was onto something. <laughs> no, I, I always. Oh, Andre wonder, was... how, how did he figure this <laughs> out? Because it's it's quite brilliant, you know, that he would link the planets that way. Yeah, very. Yeah, I mean, Andre Barbeau. Uh, he's he's probably one of the couple of the biggest influences on what I do. I mean, everything that I'm doing, pretty much, I owe to his work. Because um, my approach is a, is a little bit similar, and you know, I, I was really inspired by his work. But yeah, he's he's he's. I think he may have been the, one of the first people to see that pattern. What's really interesting, actually, is it goes back even further. It goes back into deep history, and you you can go even to. What's interesting is the last time there was a Saturn Neptune conjunction in Aries, which is where we're getting this next uh, conjunction in twenty twenty six, seventeen oh three. That was a really big year for Russian history. That was the year of the founding of Saint Petersburg. Ah, oh, okay, that's that's amazing. That's excellent. Wow. So even more. Yeah, yeah. So Peter the Great, the um, the Tsar, you know, he was trying to modernize 
Russia and he founded this completely new city, um, St. Petersburg at that time. So it was a it was a big moment of, I guess you could say initiation, which is quite obviously Aries. Um, yeah, you know, it really initiated a new phase of of Russian history. So I think we can be. I think it's fairly safe to say that twenty twenty six is going to be very big for Russia. Um, big, big new beginning, big ending, maybe both at the same time, which is obviously what you know we see at conjunctions often. But it, yeah, it, Russia is undoubtedly going to be seriously implicated. I think. I think it would be amazing if it wasn't. Um, something else that I uh, looked at is around this time in 1703. Um, this first, this the last time we had one of these conjunctions in Aries, uh, in Iceland of all places, they made the first known census or the first modern census. It was something like that. I know that the Romans used to do censuses, but if you if you look at there was some sense in which it was a kind of a, a new thing the way that they did a census of all the people in Iceland at that time and that's kind of interesting with Aries you know it's the it's the sign in which the sun is exalted you know identity and so that's also making me think a bit um about what might be coming because um I don't know if you've heard much about um Sam Altman the open AI CEO he uh, has this other project called WorldCoin, uh, which is basically, it's kind of this crazy sounding scheme where uh, they want to scan everybody's eyeballs to create like unique identifiers that can then, you can then use on the internet. So there's no, so that basically it's possible to know exactly who everyone is on the internet and everyone has to line up and scan their eyeballs in these weird devices. Um, you know, wow. it's insane, but um, it sounds insane. But you know, there's some sense to you know that's kind of the kind of thing that may you know I'm sort of wondering about when I hear that there was this census, the first census in modern times in 1703. And if you think about thematically, we might get some echo of that with this Saturn Neptune conjunction because the Neptune is kind of universal, right? It's the the ocean, everybody basically, and this is why it's. It's also associated with communism and socialism because there's this kind of universalism. Let's kind of make everyone the same and kind of give everybody the same rights and you know um, perks and all that kind of stuff. And Saturn is kind of like, well, let's let's structure this. Let's kind of figure out what's really there. Let's kind of identify everybody. Um, that's something I've just you know that just occurs to me as a possibility. I mean, it's possible to yeah, know yeah. for sure. It makes a lot of sense because Saturn. Saturn and the idea of governance or organizing something, you can think of government as Saturn something rather than Saturn by itself. And Neptune, yeah, I totally agree. I, I always see Uranus and Neptune as the two planets that uh, promote democracy and, you know, in one form or another through granting the individual more power in the organization. So that makes a lot of sense that in Sat the Saturn-Neptune uh, would correlate with that or when we talk later about Uranus connections as well because once you bring in Uranus and AI and the whole technological thing uh, it gets connected that way as well but yeah that's that's fascinating on in Iceland I mean <laughs> it, what, did it go anywhere else or just that was it that was the place where this census okay. idea uh, you know I haven't well, I, th I, I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked deeply into it actually. This is something I just found quite recently because I spend a lot of time just kind of looking at Wikipedia and <laughs> trying and figuring out kind of, you know, these finding these little events and stuff. So it's, a, it's definitely a thread to trace, which I plan to do. Um, but yeah, maybe I mean it, it, it's definitely listed as, on there as kind of the first modern census. So I presume that it, you know that idea then caught on from there because obviously you know everyone's doing it these days but um was it uh was iceland back then as, as you know this is a pre uh, 17 you said 1703 correct so yeah. that's the pre uh, the democracy started to become more popular maybe a hundred years later w was iceland already at in some way a little more progressive or but like what what could even have led to them doing a census like that doesn't it doesn't seem like a monarchic thing it seems like someone thought about the group and what benefits all of us and then launched the initiative 
Yeah, I, I don't know a lot about Iceland, uh, if in all honesty. Right. <laughs> but, but I what I, I if I I may be wrong, but if I remember correctly, I think it's Iceland is known as having one of the earliest parliaments. Oh, uh, okay. The there you go. Right, right. There you go. So that's probably yeah. That's the the way. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool because they're they're like at the forefront of that movement that was you know coming online, so to speak, over the next uh, century, two centuries. Yeah, it's phenomenal. So but yeah, I wonder with that. But now, in the current, so how would you project that? What's a guess to say on that level? Because we're not talking Russia now. We're talking on the level of um, you know the rights of the individual, the rights of the state, all those things. What, what could be a possible uh, manifestation of that in the mid part of the decade? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's something it's a, it's a difficult question. Um, I I'm not, I'm not sure about how it pertains to rights. As I mentioned, you know, I always had that theory about kind of identity. identity um, right. I also I also wonder in a more general level about um, some some the instigation of some new kind of um, like universal system or perhaps um, perhaps something to do. I also wonder about, you know, AGI or like some sort of artificial intelligence system. Um, there's some sense, you know, you, you hear a lot of talk about this, um, you know, that they're, they're essentially, if you listen to these, some of these AI people, they talk about how they're, Set creating some sort of new form of intelligence, some new life form and stuff. And it's hard for us like laymen to know like kind of how realistic that is. And, you know, is, is that nonsense? I mean, I think those of us that believe in the spirit and the soul are a bit sort of skeptical uh, maybe about that. But, but there's some, something else that makes me think about is, you know, if Neptune, Neptune could be seen as um, some sort of as spirit and Saturn is kind of concreteness. So there's some, the other image that I have in my mind is some something around kind of incarnation of some sort of like intelligence, perhaps that maybe you know, a few you could kind of see the pace that AI is advancing. Perhaps that there's some the creation of some some sort of system or something around that time, which then becomes like seen as as really foundational and important in in history. Hmm. Um, well, that hmm. would be good. Yeah, I mean, if I, I, I often thought about how there is so much possibility with technology to order the world if people were less conspiratorial and suspicious because no one wants to give their information to anyone because if you do, then someone can misuse it. But if information were used properly, you can, you know, you can achieve a lot. You can order things, bring things to a new level. But I mean, in, in the U.S., even the notion of giving people an identity card is immediately, wait, hold on, this means you can track me. No, even though it should be pretty basic, you know, to be able to identify yourself so you could vote and so forth. But there are all these cross currents circulating. And so it's very difficult. It's almost like the idea that in a way it's better to have cameras everywhere watching everything if everybody were honest. But unfortunately, people aren't. So then it leads to all kinds of other problems because on, on the plus side, having more of that, for instance, allows law enforcement to solve more crimes, things like that. But eventually people complain because they don't want to be identified. And it's the same with any technology. If what you say is right, wonderful, but people will say, wait a second, <laughs> now this artificial intelligence can control everything I do and I don't like it. And you know, then you'll get battles. So yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think. Um, I mean, the re the reality is, uh, not everybody has that much trust in in government. Some people do, some people don't. Um, and I, I'm personally a, a little bit uh, worried about AI for the, for this reason. Um, what I, what worries me about it really is um, how it will kind of grant governments the the ability to 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 know who everyone is and exactly what everybody thinks because you know up till now i mean it's generally the case like they they're not investigating you know everybody right they tend to be investigating people they think are troublemakers or are criminals or you know that kind of thing because they have to actually have human beings following the data and looking at people and say and making judgments and thinking about what they're doing right. but you know ai kind of gives them infinite 
potential to just literally look into everybody you know what what's this person saying and um you know in, in social media what are they doing where are they going who are they associating with they, all the, if they if, if it becomes possible to put these data sets together put it into an ai then it, it, you can imagine it can gain a really quite a good model of like who you are what you believe what you're doing you know and in the in the in a world with a completely b- a benevolent government you know, then great. You know, if we if we knew that the government was completely benevolent, but not, I, I think it's, it's fair enough to have some skepticism that that you know sure. sometimes there are, you know, the governments don't always uh, have your your best interests at, at heart, and there, there are, you know there is um, a corrupting influence of of money and power and involved in things. So it it, it kind of worries me a little bit. Um, and that's the kind of the nature of the moment, right? There's a lot of there's great potential and great risk. That's how I see it. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you can you can see how I mean, I, I, I saw this thing where already on these begin because these are now new websites, new engines, and they're only starting. So give it five years and they'll be way more accurate. So there's this one where you plug in a video or an audio and in a matter of seconds, it summarizes everything that has been said. So just picture that evolving. And if people take all of your videos, they'll know exactly what what you think how you think so now project that to the population you could see a a corrupt politician tailoring their message to where people are and trying to manipulate something in other words it's it's it could be uh great but it could also be incredibly problematic if it isn't well regulated and you know there aren't good counterpoints and we know what that's like in in, in government to implement such things is at least in most modern democracies, nearly impossible because people start arguing about the pros and cons. So, yeah, full agreement on that one. Yeah, and I, I think it's sort of in to follow what you say. Um, it also what's 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 interesting about it is it kind of like the logic of this technology uh, leads towards the maybe the need for people to be able to identify themselves as human beings. Um, if we have AIs that are so good that they can just, you know, they can point uh, an AI at your channel, Andre, and just say, copy, paste. And suddenly they have you and, and it's making new episodes of your channel and it's analyzed everything you've ever said and is sort of, you know, who knows how good this stuff can get, you know, can it do a really good, basically almost perfect impression of you? And, and so, you know, if if that's where we're going, then you can see why there's going to then there's going to be a push for like, well, we have to be able to identify: is this the real Andre? Is this the real Dan? Is this the real whoever? Um, and then the logic of it maybe points in the direction of this kind of like identification stuff. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. That's a, that's exactly it, and that you can see right there where uh, you know, how incredibly complicated and dangerous it would become if not. Well managed, yeah, makes a lot of sense. So this is now we're we're it's all Saturn Neptune so far, right? That we've focused on, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, Saturn Neptune is you know that conjunction in twenty twenty six is already extremely interesting, but the, that year not only has that um, particular conjunction, but it has another configuration which is also just quite extraordinary. Um, and maybe I can maybe I can show uh show you actually sure, like, share yeah. my screen and we can show you this uh configuration it's coming like just after that saturn neptune conjunction so i'm going to share my astro gold with you um can you see that yeah okay so that is showing uh so that there the saturn has already separated some from neptune right uh the way you're yeah. showing it yeah, so this is a few. This is this is July 2026. July. So okay. you can see that yeah, Saturn has separated a few degrees, ten degrees from Neptune. But now look at what the other look at what the other outer planets are doing, and this is really extraordinary. So we have okay, we've got Neptune at four degrees there, but then we also have Pluto at four degrees of Aquarius. We have Uranus at four degrees of Gemini. So just those three outer planets there pluto neptune and uranus they're in what we call a, a minor grand trine so we have pluto and uranus are in a they're in a perfect trine neptune is kind of at the the midpoint between them sextiling both of those planets and then just for good measure as well jupiter also 
in July moves opposing Pluto at four degrees of Leo as well. So we have, except for Saturn, we have all those slow moving planets at four degrees in this really incredible um, configuration. My my collaborator, I do quite a lot of work with SJ Anderson. He he nicknamed this configuration uh, the basket. You know, you, you, it's kind of rotated a little bit because um, I'm using uh, I have Aries as the first house in this chart, but you can kind of see if you tilt your head a bit, you can see how the configuration does have this this basket shape. Yeah. Um, and so this is just this is just really also really incredible um, coming in the same year. It's sort of one of the the reasons why it just seems like 2026 is going to be some kind of landmark uh, year that people are going to look back on in the future and say wow yeah that was a lot a lot of very interesting stuff happened that year um it's true very true very true that's remarkable remarkable that you get uh that many planets uh conjoining and i mean you know i rather not conjoining aligning with with each other that's really cool yeah 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 so it's it, it's what's um i mean we mentioned barbeau already andre barbeau you know, this famous french astrologer he predicted the 2020 pandemic and um he was really positive about this uh configuration you know he said it was he thought it was the best astrology of the 21st century um what he what he pointed out is that if you look at if you look at the different cycles that we're looking at here there's the separate you can you can take apart this configuration and just look at what um synodic cycles which are cycles of two planets are kind of forming part of this and so you can see that we have for example uh, pluto neptune so there's that that's one synodic cycle that's in a harmonious sextile mm -hmm. so it's an important moment in the pluto neptune cycle cool. but then we have you know uranus uh, uranus here uranus neptune also in a sextile so this uranus neptune cycle uh, which began in 1993 that's also reaching a sextile so it's also it's also in a waxing phase right they're both all these cycles are waxing they're expanding there's, there's things sort of growing and coming into right. the into the world here right. um and then pluto uranus as well is in a trine and this pluto uranus cycle goes back to 1965 66 the mid 60s so that's another cycle it's like it's in a harmonious waxing aspect Mm -hmm. um yeah so barbeau thought this was uh just the yeah he said it was the most remarkable astrology of the 21st century and that he thought it was heralding um the sort of blooming of some sort of new world civilization that um i think he used he used he said something like um that it was also uh symbolic of the uplifting of the less fortunate people of the world into some new world civilization somehow so he's really positive about it and um, thought it you know held great things and what he also said was that that there was a he thought there was a crisis that would begin with, a, with in 2020 with a pandemic which of course it did you know anybody did this years in advance and he thought that the crisis would be over basically sort of, some sort of world crisis would be done by this 2026 basket and then it's kind of like you know then the good times roll kind of thing um so that's one very uh positive vision really of 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 this decade now i don't know i'm not sure <laughs> he's right <laughs> I, was, I was gonna say that if, if we stop there and then that's it we say no more then everybody can sleep happy but then there's <laughs> but <laughs> there's more <laughs> <laughs> there are other ways to look at this. <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean well, firstly, you know, he might be right. Let's yeah, bear that yeah, in mind. Right? He might be right. And he was a great astrologer. So I, you know, and I wouldn't necessarily want to bet against Andre Barbeau. You know, he's an all-time great. He studied astrology all his life. He sure. um, developed this kind of style of astrology himself that, you know, that I've kind of been sort of doing myself. And, um, you know, so I wouldn't bet against Barbeau. But I'm, I'm not, I don't know about you, but I, you do wonder, like, how can everything be kind of hunky dory uh by 2026 um it doesn't right now to me it, it seems just taking the astrology out of it seems a little bit unlikely that um that the world can can uh somehow come together into some um 
new world civilization, as he called it, kind of so quickly. I mean, things are very divided and it does make you wonder what, you know, if he's right, what would need to happen between now and then to kind of, for that to, to be true? I have, a, I have a theory. The theory could be if you see the situation right now, there appears to be a, a bit of a battle between conventional, you know, Western democracy, something that comes out of the last 200 years where the individual gains more and more power, but there's still the group, the government and so forth. But there are countries like China, Russia, or any country where there is anybody that is an, a, an actual or an aspiring fascist. It's the opposite approach where uh, you're taking the, you know, the Viking approach or the idea of a monarch, someone being in charge. Now, if as we go into the middle of the decade, those impulses are either checked or, you know, greatly or partly or mostly checked so that democracy is reinforced, you could get a, a period of, of growth and development because if uh, the world goes the other way, you know, people are scared all the time. What happens if, if the Chinese system is successful or the Russian system and so forth? That, in my opinion, would not be good. I know I'm biased because I, I'm defending the system I live in, but to me it appears to be, it's better in that there's more freedom. If you want to use the keyword uh, that is, in my opinion, most you know, explicitly connected to your and to freedom for the individual. If you take that away, then that would not be this. That would not be the potential. And even if that were true, that doesn't mean things become, you know, by any means perfect. It just means it's a step in the right direction. Uh, that's one possibility. Other than that, I, I agree with you, though, because based on the current uh, patterns we're seeing, it seems pretty improbable, you know, that things would be utopian, certainly. I, I don't see utopia at all. That, to me, feels sure. completely... Um, unrealistic, you know, I, that unrealistic, I know is a Saturn word, but, uh, you know, Saturn has to kind of, you know, put a stamp of approval on things in the end. And it seems unrealistic. Yes. Yeah. Saturn always gets a, gets a big say. <laughs> yeah. Well, because Saturn is the order of things. So whatever order we land on, whatever you color with, it's still Saturn. And the idea that it has to be grounded, workable and so forth is very important. So. Uh, but there is a possibility because we're seeing that, you know, to, as, as well as you're seeing all the problems we're experiencing, you can also see that China's not doing as well as they had expected to do. Russia's certainly not doing as well as they were expecting to do. The U.S. gets a lot of criticism, but where would you rather be at the moment in terms of world powers? I don't see the logic of being in any, in any other place. If there is a conflict or if there's a dispute, the U.S. is still the place to be. Now, there are arguments around that, too, including, for example, the U.S. has a huge debt. And yes, I'm aware of all that. It's, it's you know, quite complicated. But overall, I still believe that the world order uh, remaining democratic and the power of the democratic world order is stronger. Do you, do you agree with that or do you feel that there is there are lots of arguments on the other side well yeah i, I wouldn't say i completely agree um i mean I'm part, you might be right firstly um i would certainly certainly say that it's, it's hard to see exactly how things are gonna shake out but my my suspicion is a little bit more that um if we're the, the, what might come about is a new a sort of reordering of the global system, not one not one in which say you know suddenly China rules the world or something in the same way that you know the United States has been the most powerful, um, you know, it's been the sole superpower for quite quite some time um, so, since the breakup of the Soviet Union. I don't think we're not going to something like that. Um, what I my suspicion is more that there's just going to be some sort of um, more of a rebalancing towards a sort of multipolarity. I not I'm not sure that um, I find it unlikely. I think that um, that states like uh, say Russia and China and so on are going to adopt the sort of American system. I, I don't know. I don't know if I necessarily. Um, believe that all uh, 
civilizations and kind of are inclined the same way and kind of like like to govern themselves the, the, the same way that's not to justify and not trying to justify kind of you know the bad stuff that obviously happens in in those countries that's not where right. i'm coming from at all but but i do think there are maybe differences in, in styles and sort of what works in different places to an extent um and I, so i wonder if there's going to be some rebalancing towards a more multipolar system i think you know i don't i think the united states is still going to be um you know a very very powerful country um and it has so many advantages you know it's it's got like a huge it's a very big country it's got access to both uh, both big oceans and you know it's just it, it's just unfeasible to me that that, that that's going to really change in a big way um but at the same time i do think if there is to be some uh some kind of peaceful outcome to this sort of what's going on now it may i'm more hoping that there's going to be some kind of live and let live kind of um situation which actually i personally believe can be beneficial for everyone everybody um we saw for example in the cold war um in my opinion how you know the the, the existence of the soviet union actually caused was, was really helpful to say to workers rights for example in the west because there had to be some concessions to kind of you know to, to um to stave off the possibility of things going completely in the other direction and it for me like i what i think is important is kind of balance really in all things um and i think if one state has too much power the tendency is or one person or one entity the tendency is generally towards in my opinion towards corruption and so i think um personally a bit this this is getting a little bit into what one thinks is good which is not yeah, really, no, you know, exactly, really yeah, yeah. that side right it makes sense <laughs> yeah it makes sense i mean the thing is though that see there there are so many factors in play for example when you were talking about AI, part of the problem that these countries that are doing it in the, let's call it the old style, you know, they, I sometimes think in Russia, they think they're still in 1940. The problem is that technology now moves the information around a lot more quickly. So now you have, I just read this article yesterday in the New York Times, women in Russia are starting to get really upset because their sons or their husbands are not being returned from their deployments. and because they can move the information around really quickly, they can gang up on the government much more quickly. And in China, the women are not wanting to reproduce, which is a big problem for the Chinese government because they don't want to bring in immigration. So controlling people in a, in a dictatorial way is getting harder and harder. That's my sense based because of technology. So that's something that can really throw things off because you have to now use that technology and use it to control the people that's a tricky game, in my opinion, a tweet is own, but it's harder and harder. Back a hundred years ago, you would just print anything, hide things for a decade at a time. You know, no one really knew what happened. You know, it can all be put under the rug. Not so easy anymore. So that's the Uranian, uh, you know, factor exploding, Neptune as well. And that could be a counterpoint. But I, I can see where you're going to with the fact that I know what you mean. If you, if, uh, unless you said, Okay, well, this this basket here that we're looking at, it establishes, for example, imagine if, let's be a little utopian for a second here, and imagine that most of the world decided, you know, it's better to tell the truth than to lie. Let's make the, telling the truth more of a value here that we should all hold to instead of this constant disinformation. Now, that's really tricky because the countries that don't do it that way thrive on that, right? But even if those countries were forced to literally through technology or whatever to be more in contact with their people and respect their people a little more and give them more rights uh, then there would still be differences because Ch the chinese culture is different than the american culture is different than the russian culture they'll want to do it in a different way but at least there's less of a chance that we're going to have a cold war where I'm, i presume you'll bring this up that you know based on past patterns such as like 75 to or 76 to 86 the sextile that was the cold war and then you know interestingly that passes and then things got better so there's a sense that it could be repeated again then we're all going to be sitting around wondering when the next missile will land on you know on top of our head from somewhere which would be a lot more uncomfortable obviously right so this right. is the, yeah <laughs> well yeah should we should we get into the the pluto neptune sure yeah yeah cycle and so we can uh 
kind of get into some of that. So, so the thing that I've been focused on most over the last few months is the Pluto Neptune cycle. So this, uh, this is, this is of the kind of standard major planets that we use in mundane astrology. This is the longest, the slowest cycle. So it's, it's about 492 years let's just call it 500 years every 500 years pluto and neptune can join and um so this is this is kind of like the reason well the reason i decided to focus on this cycle is i I think it's it's foundational right it's the deep it's the sort of bass notes if if astrology is music the, the, the music of the spheres then this is the base note. This is the kind of deepest level. You know, Pluto Neptune cycle. It's really about like really um, core belief, faith, consciousness. These kind of really um, big questions that kind of underlie everything. You know that we 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 tend to get lost in politics and geopolitics and so on. But but what's often I think driving history is our fund like deepest fundamental beliefs and um, and that's pluto neptune um speaks to so this as you'll see there's a sextile here pluto neptune now so um you probably know that it's actually this sextile is nothing new pluto and neptune have been in a sextile for a long time um since really the 1940s but let's just let's just go back to the start of this cycle so um here is here was the last uh set of pluto neptune conjunctions 1891 there were three of them so there there tends to be three hits with these conjunctions because of retrogrades um but the last time they met so this only happens every 500 years or so 1891 and 1892 in the sign of gemini now um the way these conjunctions work is actually they kind of move slowly through the signs so you'll get a few conjunctions in Taurus, say, well, say start with Aries, a few conjunctions in Aries, then they move to Taurus and they just creep through. So every 500 years, you get a new conjunction and you'll get several in each sign. So the way I've seen this is it almost kind of gives us a kind of, you know, a, um, a sequence of great ages um, where we, Pluto Neptune conjunctions are happening in a certain sign um, and they moved into Gemini in 1398 1399 right so then we start to get the first pluto neptune conjunctions in in gemini you know what comes at around that time you know we start to have the the renaissance and then we have the reformation we have the enlightenment we have the sort of scientific revolution we this is really the sort of if you look a lot of historians will kind of date um the the modern era really to around that time to like the 15th century with the the renaissance in italy and everything that came after that copernicus and martin luther and all this stuff i mean it was really notable that we this was shortly after those the first conjunctions in in that sign we have the printing press and it's all very mercurial and if yeah. you see the yeah. sort of mercurial nature of our times you know it's it's like unmistakable the importance mm-hmm. of data communication you know the fast moving nature of things mm-hmm. like there's no other planet surely that most characterizes the times and so we had this the second set of these conjunctions uh, in 1891 1892 so so this was the kind of seed moment of the the big cycle that we're in um and so what i've been looking at is you know well, what happened in this period of the, the late 19th century around the time when you know not at this exact moment but just when these planets were in in orb say 15 degrees that's the orb that um, Richard Tarnas, who's another astrologer who's done, you know, this kind of work, he uses the 15 degree orb for these conjunctions. So it, it means that the sort of the last, um, the last sort of quarter of the 19th century is our kind of seed time for our cycle. And so if you look at that period, you see a lot of interesting things happening, a lot of interesting trends beginning. There was a huge, it was a really um, technologically important time for science and technology that was like the sort of electrical revolution right we had um we had thomas edison and nikola tesla and people like this just just um electrifying the world we had the birth of flight around this time this is the first the first planes basically came at this time um radio by marconi these kind of technologies that connect 
the world together that have led to this, you know, where are we now? We're, we're in this world of like instant connection, quick Correct. movement around the world. Correct. That yeah. it all goes back to this period um, with this, this conjunctional period. And so what I've been looking at is like, well, all these trying to trace all these different threads that go back to this, this time. So there's this technological explosion. So, you know, it's almost like science started to do magic at this time. You know, it was like magical things. We can now fly because of right. science and technology. We can speak to each other at great distances um, because of science and technology, et cetera. You know, the cinema as well. This is also, you can also take that back to this period. Um, at the same time, there's also uh, an interesting period um, for, for like spiritually speaking. We have um, a kind of occult revival at that time. You know, the theosophy, um, you could say, you could date modern astrology to that time. It was a kind of the astrological revival. Um, the the ideas that, that were coming around then there was this kind of with theos the theosophists and um anthroposophists and so on they were fusing um sort of western esotericism with eastern ideas and reincarnation hinduism buddhism spiritual evolution all these ideas which have kind of uh ultimately kind of permeated the world quite deeply there's so many people are into you know, that you can really date sort of new age thinking to this period as well i think um, there's so many people who are, you know, they do they do yoga, they believe in reincarnation, they, you know, they are vegetarian, all that, all that stuff. Really, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, it's true, it's true, it's totally true. Yeah, yeah you're <laughs> you're definitely tagging it, you know, including that. Uh, one thing that came to mind is that I always associate Gemini to flying and birds, and the idea of, of, in fact, uh, best story I can think of is this uh, great spiritual master I had the good fortune to hang out with in the 20th century. And this guy was a Gemini, and he actually liked to, he, he met, you know, was a meditator, obviously, but he would sometimes describe his inner world as flying around, number one. But he would put on wings and throw himself off the side of a mountain to actually experience flying, you know. And yeah. he had a, a falcon that he would, would land on his, you know, he would train the falcon. So, in other words, the bird energy and flying, uh, and, and then, of course, mercurial, because Mercury and Gemini and so forth. So the printing press wasn't that also part of the the 1399 was that when it first came online or was it later the idea of so print? it came on well yeah this is the interesting thing so it came online the printing press emerges at the sextile so the first major ah, aspect of okay. the cycle uh, around around the mid 15th century 1440 1450 ah, sextile okay. orb the printing press appears so this is kind of a bit this is an interesting analog of our time, which I'll get to in a sec when I talk about the sextile. Um, the other interesting thing that was born at this time around these conjunctions is um, really the birth of atomic nuclear physics. We discovered the electron in 1897, which is uh, pretty, you know, these planets were still well in orb of conjunction at that time. So it's the discovery of the electron. And, and so it's the first um, sort of peek into the structure of the atom, um, which I think ultimately it ultimately bore fruit in the, the, the atomic bomb and nuclear power and things like that. So that's another thread. And the other interesting thread, um, which uh, I've been also been following is the UFO phenomenon also really dates to this time, which is something we're hearing a fair bit about these days. It's kind of exploding into the news quite a bit. Um, in, in the 1890s, there was this huge wave of sightings of what's called mystery airships in the United States and then and then beyond in other parts of the world. There are these strange airships that could you know, we didn't really have any have those kind of airships at the time. They could move very fast. They had very strong searchlights. They had strange occupants um, who people talked to. And it was kind of um the technology that people were experiencing was just ahead of like what we actually had at the time. But these <laughs> those <laughs> that's, in, that's in the 1890s, right? In the 1890s, yeah, well, yes. That's, okay, that I didn't know. That's phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, fabulous. And if yeah. you if you read some of the kind of best known, most famous uh, UFO researchers, people like um, Jacques Vallée, John Keel, these are kind of quite credit. You know, they're kind of serious um, people. Who are, they don't get too carried away. They were really concerned with trying to figure out you know, what is going on with this weird phenomenon, and uh, they generally will um, highlight that time as the kind of they as the kind of moment when the, it, this these strange uh, appearances start to appear like technology 
So it was a it was a technological explosion in human society. But then there are these weird uh, airships appearing that we see. Ah, that's that's a piece of technology. That's how we would perceive it. Now, people generally say, well, um, perhaps this phenomenon has been around for a long time. You know, people have always seen strange lights in the sky, strange beings, and you know, in the, all the folklore of the world. Um, but this was the first moment when it started to appear as technology, which is kind of interesting, given that it was also a period of incredible technological growth as well. So that's basically, this is the conjunction. Now, um, the, this cycle is very slow, of course. And um, when the, the these two planets start to get into a sex style, so basically Neptune obviously moves quite a lot faster than Pluto. And um, so uh, it, it was roughly in the 1940s um, when the two planets reached their sex style. Um, now, I've got it. 49, yeah, I've got... 49 to 59. That decade is pretty much steady sex style, I think, somewhere in there. Yeah, I have it. Well, I have a chart I can show you. Um, this is this is from a program called a website called Archetypal Explorer. And it allows you to visualize aspects. Can you, can I, maybe I need to sh actually share this particular uh, window. Can you, you see this now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. There it shows, so, it, it shows it like around 1950, that, that wave part is the period when they're sexed out, right? Till... Yeah. So what this shows, you can see that this, this is, this is basically how, f how many degrees Neptune and Pluto are away from the sextile. So you can see the scale on the, y-axis goes from 10 to zero so as soon as you start seeing a line uh here they're 10 they're 10 degrees away from a sextile and you can see that this they get closer and closer through the 1940s now i, I use a six degree orb maybe this, this is what tanas uses for the sex for sextile six degrees so you can see that they get within six degrees in the early 1940s really um they, they, you can say that they're, they're in orb from here where this line comes up. Um, and then these periods where at the top, where it's got zero, these are, these are exact sex styles. So between 1950 and 1956, they make a set of exact sex styles. But what you'll see is that actually, you see this line here, this on the right, this line shows, this is where we are now. Um, but pretty much for the entire period since the 1940s these two planets have been in a sextile um it's been a very long sextile and the reason for that is that um a certain point in the cycle pluto has a very elliptical orbit eccentric orbit whatever you want to call it and it, at a certain time i.e now it speeds up because it's moving much faster than normal and it moves at roughly the same speed as neptune um around the zodiac so there's right. this you have these long periods where they're moving at the same speed so they just stay in the same aspect which is what we've had basically since the 1940s. So everyone alive today, you, me, pretty much probably almost everybody watching has a Pluto-Neptune sextile in their natal chart. And I think for a lot, a lot of people, myself included, at first thought, well, that doesn't really mean anything then because you know it's been in this sextile for so long. Like, what can we really tell from that? And it was really looking at Archetypal Explorer and visualizing this that allowed me to kind of I got some realization about ah we can we can actually see something of you know something's going on with this there's a bit of structure to what's happening um because you can see that so the the, plant, the plants come into sextile in the 1940s now we talked about what was born at the conjunction and uh or what was kind of seeded there what happens in the 1940s well of course we have the we have the nuclear bomb, you know, which is very significant. Nuclear power, 1942, the first controlled uh, fission reaction. Obviously, what happened in 1945, the the, the bombs in World War II, um, and and I, as I mentioned, nuclear physics is kind of really born at the conjunction. We have the the discovery of the electron at that time. Um, Einstein comes up with E equals M C squared. Uh, the latter part of the conjunctional period as well, 1905, just sort of at the end. So, you know, what's seeded is atomic physics, and then it's it's kind of ugly fruit comes into being in the 1940s with the atomic bomb. Um, now, what I've my little theory about this uh, is that you can see that the, the these peaks right between 1950 and 1956, 
And then there's another set of peaks. These are exact sextiles between 1976 and 1986. And then you can see that what happened after 86 is that they started to kind of separate. You can still say they're within six. They're still in orb, but then in this period here, so this is between 1986 and now there's been this big dip. So they got kind of far away from a sextile in this period. Right. And so if you look at this period here between the first set of peaks and the second set of peaks, well, what is this? This is kind of the, this is the Cold War, really. You can see this was the period of time when, um, you know, the US and the USSR were kind of raged against each other. And there was this threat of nuclear war that hung over us through this whole period. Um, and then, you know, 86, uh, well, was, um, there was the year of the Chernobyl disaster. Um, but like after this time, and actually 86, by the way, was the year when we had the most number of nuclear weapons in the world. So you can look, look at the statistics, the maximum number of nukes ever, 86. The last time these two planets made these exact sextiles, then they separate. You know, we get to 1990 here, 91, the, the USSR falls apart. And that threat of kind of, you know, of nuclear war, it, it really did go away, didn't it? I mean, we weren't so we weren't as worried about it. It didn't seem as imminent, even if we still had the weapons. Right. Um, but what what I've noticed is, I mean, you, you may have noticed that we, we're hearing a bit more about nuclear weapons these days. You know, there's been yes. around the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. There's this question of like, oh, would will Russia use a tactical nuclear weapon and stuff like that? And then, right. you know, it, it's much more present in the sort of what we're hearing mm -hmm. and True. i think it's no coincidence that we are coming back to another set of these exact sex styles uh between 2026 and 2032 we're going to come back to this period and so my little theory really is that it's kind of a, a recapitulation a little bit of the cold war period that we might be coming into where there's this short period it's not anywhere near as long as the cold war but maybe there's going to be some sort of face off right where we get another little cold war hopefully it's you know it doesn't explode into something worse than that yeah, um, yeah hopefully I, I, yeah i mean I'm, I'm hopeful that it that it won't um i don't think it will but i think it you know it might be it might feel threatening there might be some moments where it feels a bit cuban missile crisis for example or something like that you know there's a, there's some because i'm wondering you know if we are to come up with some sort of new settlement where the world doesn't feel like it's you know kind of at, um, at war you know this this climate now is not very good right there's this big kind of a lot of tension and geopolitics and in, in the world mm. i mean i wonder if maybe this there's, there's going to be some sort of face-off where there's a there's a question of like well look if we don't come to a settlement here we're going to end up you know in nuclear war or something like that we have to we have to come to a settlement rather than go to that place and so i you know my hope is that that's kind of that's the kind of crucible that's the cauldron that's kind of going to brew this sort of new uh settlement and maybe a new world um so that would mean that there's kind of a bit of a longer crisis that goes on until early 2030s mid 2030s and then it kind of resolve somehow and and then we're kind of you know that's just a different kind of theory to barbeau's vision um and maybe barbeau is right maybe something maybe this kind of resolves itself earlier early on i don't know well um, you know it could be too that barbeau can be right and this can be right in the sense that if you look at the cold war period yes that was definitely there in people's minds and there were certainly I mean, we don't, if we get to the Cuban Missile Crisis, that was pretty scary. That's probably the scariest moment around everyone get under their desks, as if that's going to help type thing. But that's what was going on. But overall, the world was actually progressing and growing significantly in, in multiple ways. In fact, the 50s were, by many people's accounts, that's what these people that want to go back to making America great again, they want to go back to the 1950s, which of course is not a good idea for other reasons. But point being that, that we did survive that. And it could be that you could get a great period of expansion in one way and have this thing lurk in the background as well. Because, I mean, think of the 1980s. I remember that period. In the 1980s, yes, uh, there was this thought that uh, the U.S. and Russia were on the brink. But lots of people just lived their lives. The 80s were the U.S. were this, 
even crazier than the 70s, you know, MTV started, it became this free for all. And if you mention nuclear war to those people, I don't think they were paying a whole lot of attention, even though in the background, yes, it was definitely super dangerous. So it's possible that we could have both of those uh, simultaneously. Something I noted that's very interesting along your uh, mention of the electron in 1891, 92. So it occurred to me that the point where there would be a great friction was at the semi-square, and that was 1930 to 33 of those two. And that's also when Pluto came online. And Pluto, I equate to the raw nu a nuclear power planet, so to speak, which is the one half of that equation. And then it's followed by the sextiles in the 40s, the 70s, and now this level as well. So in 1930 to 33, first of all, is the start of the Great Depression. That's really rough throughout the whole world. And it's really where fascism was born out of that, because fascism needs that kind, I think, is my opinion, needs that kind of chaos and, and, you know, a period of distress to get these strong men to come in and suggest crazy things that people will follow them and so forth. And that in a way reflects the, you know, the sort of the raw energy of astrology where typically it is the 45s and the 90s, you know, the, the harder aspects that are more troublesome. So from that perspective, I believe I looked at, which one did I look at? I think it's in 2060 when they square, I think. Something like that. In case, you know, you want to look <laughs> further ahead for real trouble around Pluto Neptune. Not, not worrying about 2060 yet. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, very interesting. Yeah, it's actually very interesting that you mentioned the semi-square. So, I, I skipped over that, but um, the semi, so the semi sextile of these two planets um, and the semi-square, both you can see interesting things happening both of them this is a very slow moving cycle so these these minor aspects they you can still see real uh, important things happening at those times and so the, the semi uh semi sextile roughly 1914 to 1919 depending on the orb you use is the first world war um and i mentioned that the electron was discovered at the conjunction at the semi sextile the, the proton was discovered ah, right so okay. the second element of the of the atom discovered at the semi sextile semi square as you mentioned like uh, it was exact i think 1930 1930 to 1932 um semi square the neutron was discovered so we had the three elements kind of coming in, into place at these aspects and I, and yes as you mentioned um you had hitler's takeover of germany at that semi square which is you know and then of course we get to the um sextile and we have the the war itself the interesting thing is you can also you can also trace nazism back to the conjunctional period um the particularly the kind of occult um uh, underpinnings of of nazism you know there's a lot of lot, as a lot of people know the nazis were there was a kind of sort of dark spiritual element to nazism. yeah but, but you know now you mentioned that you see with pluto when you think of pluto neptune it's the idea of neptune is a very visionary kind of energy where you you imagine something that could be that you then would incarnate pluto is the classic fascist i mean that's that's the idea of domination so the idea that hitler would be born then and feel like i need to you know ha there need to be one person one central uh power controlling everything it, it goes really well with pluto neptune let's just say that it's it's a perfect fit yeah it's, yeah it does and and there's also there were also some um What's also interesting, I don't know if you've ever uh, read Jung, um, Carl Jung's essay on the Nazis. Um, he wrote a very interesting essay uh, in the 1930s, I believe it was, about the Nazis, about the kind of um, so the sort of occult origins and psychological nature of Nazism. And he focused on how he thought that Nazism was some kind of uh, cult of Wotan, um, Wotan or Odin, this Norse god, the god of war and magic, um, among other things. And uh, you can actually, and, and and a lot of Nazis were quite explicitly um, evoking Wotan. Now, interestingly, this you can trace this back to the conjunctional period, the late nineteenth century. You, you had these kind of um, these some certain German Germanic thinkers who started to get interested in Wotan. At that time, and 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 this period is also the first period where they started to use the symbol of the swastika, as well. So you can also see 
can trace that back then. The other interesting thing is Wotan is one kind of has been seen as a kind of is an analog of Mercury. Um, Wotan, Wedden, which is where we get Wednesday from, which is you know oh, Wednesday, interesting. Mercury. Interesting. Um, interesting. And and this conjunction, this Pluto Neptune conjunction, is, is in Mercury's sign of Gemini. So there's all sorts of you know weird kind of stuff going on kind of under the hood and pluto neptune is is fundamentally it has to do with deep beliefs about the world and stuff and one thing that was born is these kind of nazi beliefs the other interesting thing that was born at that time was zionism as well theodore herzl um you can trace that back to the eight you know the 1890s as well so that's also born and interestingly what happens in the 1940s we have the second world war we have you know the the full fruit of nazism and we also have the foundation of israel at that time as well um from its origins in the conjunctional period so there's so much you can see through this cycle it's kind of it's it's kind of crazy actually it's 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 been um really interesting kind of digging into it but uh yeah so what to take from that uh you know I'll, I'll leave that to the viewers to think about but it does seem like we're coming back to this sort of tense time really and the other thing by the way as well i think is worth pointing out is is um in the 1890s the we also saw the first attempts to create a kind of world government a world parliament if you go onto if you sort of do some research, look at like world government and Wikipedia, you'll see that there was this convention of a world parliament for the first time um, in that late 19th century period uh, where the Pluto-Neptune conjunction is beginning. Um, and what happens in the 40s when this period here, after the war, we get the establishment of like the UN system, you know, Bretton Woods, all that kind of thing. We get this sort of like this kind of first attempt at a universal system. And then we when look at this. That? When was that? Uh, when the, was the? Because you said 19, the, after the oh, Second World War. After the Second World War, so it's during the during the sextile. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And then and then so it's interesting we have that, that system established here when we get to the start of this um, this aspect, and then when the uh, planets separated from the sextile. Here around you know 1991, where we have the, we have the fall of the Soviet Union, we have a kind of it's like a sort of um, new like there was sort of some sort of reversal or some new global system which was actually more one where the United States was kind of more dominant right it was the sole superpower and that this is why I also kind of think that that that's what this cycle one of the things this cycle is concerned with the world system. And so is there some new world system kind of going to be negotiated uh, over this next period? And then we come out of this, uh, when the, se the sextile starts to separate, we've kind of got some new global settlement. That's another thing that I'm um, wondering about, really. Well, you know, the thing is, to me, the takeaway is that if we want to be optimistic, is let's put our faith in the fact that it is a sextile you know, so that hopefully good things will come out of it. I mean, even when you look at the previous, if you look at, for example, 49 to 59, that's in the post, it is a cold war, but it's in the post very destructive period when the world is grappling with what just happened. And if anything, it's reorganizing itself and things are basically moving forward. And, and in 75 to 87, there were a lot of worries, but again, we got through it. So let's hope that, as you say, it correlates, you know, with with uh, those advances and that world order. I mean, think about it right now. In the world order, we have the United Nations, but they don't really respect it. They don't. You know, too many countries are too interested in their own affairs. And if there were more, more truth, you know, when when people are discussing what they're going to do, you have to keep the other side in mind. It, it, there seems to be this. Right now, we seem to be at this point. I'm hoping it's near the end. You know, cross my fingers this idea that everything is I win, you lose. There's no no sense that we need to meet halfway in order to resolve problems. And un until that happens, how could you have a world panel like the United Nations, China, Russia? They're basically playing political games at this point. So something has to change for that to ever be, you know, to ever be true. But it would be a, a well, let's hope. Let's hope that Andre is right. <laughs> the other Andre. <laughs> Let's hope. Yeah.
yeah yeah no ab absolutely um it, you're right though it, it is a set it is a sex style right it's not like you'd be more worried if it, we were you know we had the square coming up that, that well i mean cheap. look look at how nasty the, se the semi-square was a worldwide major major problem everywhere there was this famine i mean it came on the right after the roaring 20s boom everything collapsed all kinds of things went wrong including that the discovery of Pluto, which tends to happen when planets are first discovered, takes a while for things to settle out. And I would consider that probably the most difficult and dangerous moment of that century in those years. So that mirrors the semi squares, you know, there uh, some consider them minor. I consider them the 248 series is pretty noticeable. You know, you can tell in your own chart when I follow my chart, I can tell when the moon is 45 versus when it's 40. It's pretty obvious, you know, that the there's a frictional thing happening versus a smooth type of energy. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree completely. The semi-square is no joke. <laughs> right. Exactly, exactly. And, <laughs> and, especially, and especially when you're dealing with big, big uh, orbits like this, you know, it's, it'll have more impact because it's rare. So it, it really, you know, identifies a period uh, as being important. Yeah. The other the other thing that um, I think we can maybe be another sort of grounds for more hopeful thinking. If we go back, I'll just go back to the chart for a second. Um, if we just like look at the basket again, um, can you see the the chart? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so part of this uh, configuration is this Uranus Uranus Neptune sextile as well. So that. That's the first major aspect of the Uranus-Neptune cycle that began in 93, around then, so this early 90s time. And um, and that was, I think, a pretty, I mean, it was, I think for a lot of the world, that was a pretty good time. And it was like a time of quite a hopeful time. I think it was, you know, the, the, the wall had come down the soviet union had disintegrated I and mean, obviously that was very difficult for a lot of people in russia for example like living through that period i think seeing everything collapse yeah. don't want to don't want to kind of ignore that you know it wasn't necessarily good for for everybody but it was also the time of the world wide web right that's another another part of this um mm -hmm. and so there's a certain sense of like you know you're um, neptune being kind of um oneness and connective you know sort of connectivity uh with uranus this you know the technology and so on we have this suddenly there's this network that that's connecting everybody um and it was a hopeful time there was a lot of kind of um deals done that kind of unified countries i mean the eu of course come, goes back to that period uh nafta was also goes back to that that exact period now i don't necessarily i'm not arguing those things were like universal goods but in an archetypal sense they were kind of about yes. there was some sense of unifying and harmonizing and kind of creating a um sort some sort of bigger network and playing field and that kind of thing yeah so that yes. you know that that cycle those kind of that feeling is also potentially you know is also actually going to be somehow realized at this sex style so there is some sense i think we've got to, we've got to factor that in that there is maybe some sense of connectivity and unification and those mm. kind of themes you know might be if yeah. i may uh, just a quick comment i i checked and this is in a way it's pretty funny the 40 degree uranus neptune was 2014 2015 and then from 17 to 20 it was semi-square <laughs> you have to laugh <laughs> because that's when you know we had brexit and then the trump years which i mean I lived through those years here, just complete and utter chaos around government and, you know, the way people were feeling. And then in 2020, then it separates and that. So now now we're moving into the sextile. So that's an example, again, where the harsher aspects, because the pre in the pre Trump years, in a way, yes, there was tension, but it was basically people fell asleep and then they woke up in a, in a, in a pretty major way around the, the, you know, the tension of the semi square. Yeah, yeah. 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 The other, I mean, the so that I think like the technology is obviously a big part of this picture as well. Technology and and the, and the internet and probably AI. Um, if we go back to the uh, 
the chart that I was showing you, the the sextile chart, um, just to show you again. So, um, looking at this thing again, you know, 1947 was a very big year as well. 1947, the sextile is getting very close here, and there's a Saturn Pluto conjunction. In 1947. 1947 is one of the most important years of the the, the, the 20th century, I think. Um, one of the things, for one one of the main reasons, this is the year of the invention of the transistor. And that really kind of enables the computer revolution that, that followed. Um, and you can again see this piece of electrical technology that's so like transformative coming into being when this sextile is getting close. Um, but uh so all these cycles that we're uh that we're looking at they all have to do with with information technology to a sense there's also a theme that's running through them i'm going to show you something kind of interesting um if i can can you see the uh map that i've brought up mm, not yet right now it's showing pluto neptune and sextile still okay there, there yeah yeah mm -hmm. okay so this is uh this is this is an interesting uh, diagram. This is this is what was called the all red line. Right, this is a this is something that the British built uh, in the eighteen the late nineteenth century. So they were building this and, it, and it, they inaugurated in I think it was nineteen o two. This is a global electrical telegraph network, right. and they built this. Is, this is the first global electrical network. Right, they built this thing and they had undersea cables. You can see going uh, under the Atlantic. And then the Pacific, um, and this was this was in the conjunctional period. So it's 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 really funny because you can kind of see this archetypal kind of internet almost, right? There's this there's this little this is another signal we could have picked up at that time. There will be a global network that uses electricity. Um, it's so fascinating to see that. Then, if we look at in 1965, Pluto Uranus conjunction we have the creation of ARPANET, which is kind of the forerunner of the internet. Right, right. Maybe not 1965, but that period when those period. planets were in orbit of conjunction, we have um, we have the kind of next incarnation of this thing. You know, this is a, this is ARPANET. This is a map showing that. This is it, this was by the 70s, but this thing is built in the 1960s. This is the 1960s. forerunner of the internet. Then if we go to 1993 this uranus-neptune conjunction uh, mm -hmm. we have the World Wide web right so there's all these cycles are just speaking to the creation of this technology um and so yeah. i really think that one of the big um themes of 2026 and what this basket is pointing to is something to do with the potential of technology and probably i mean probably ai has got a big something big to do with it what one thing that i'm that i find interesting is the potential for ai to um completely destroy boundaries between people who speak different languages i don't know if you've seen um that they have this ai uh program now that can well, not program it's a very old term but it's ai <laughs> right it's <laughs> AI, engine, sorry, my, yeah. it's ai thing that can um it can basically take a video of you and it can translate it into any kind of you know a different language but it'll also change how your mouth moves so wow. it looks like exactly like you're speaking that language and it changes even it even makes sure it keeps your accent so it even sounds like it's like your voice but you're speaking a different language but it looks like you're, you know you're, you're you're really speaking it and this is the kind of thing that makes me think like what could that do you know you could have a conversation with like i don't know a chinese person in guangzhou and you know just have a conversation and to you it's in english and to them it's in chinese and suddenly you're exchanging in a way that has never been possible before yeah and yeah you know you know by the way you can see how i mean you can see how on the upside this is wonderful because w whether you tell me about the original lines to the oceans in the late uh, 19th century that's an attempt to connect everyone now that's a great idea the problem is that it like anything in life, you run into problems with it. You know, people start to lay out their parcels and all that. But the idea is that it's great because you're connecting people in new ways. So what could be fabulous if I could connect with someone of a different culture? Absolutely. 
and then we can start thinking of all the things that are not so good around that, right? So, but it's always like that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, there are there are really uh, there's really hope re reasons to be kind of kind of hopeful, I think, and um, lot potential, and then reasons to be cautious as well, and. That's kind of just the nature of the times, the the darkness and the light. I think it's I think it's also kind of quite mercurial, um, in that Mercury, uh, it will it, it's kind of neither benefic or malefic, in, you know, as a way in the terms that they use in traditional astrology. When Mercury is with the benefics, Mercury's benefic, and when Mercury's with malefics, Mercury's malefic. And in the planet Mercury, it it, it would always it's always uh, it's tidally locked with the sun, so one half is always light and the other half is always dark. You can even see it in the astronomy. Um, so there's this light and darkness thing. It's very, very mercurial. And I think it kind of runs through the times, the dualities. There's all these dualities in, the, in this modern world. And, you know, even in politics, it's always, even if it doesn't mean much these days, as you know, it's split like the left and the right and kind of it runs through everything. Um, and it's really core to like the nature of our of our times um yeah it makes I, a lot of sense it makes a lot of sense it's very true yeah absolutely the mercurial and he, he probably also links with the 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 you know mercury as a primarily as an air sign planet i mean it, it's connected to gemini and virgo but gemini seems to be the more pure mercury and the um separately those jupiter saturn conjunctions that are now going to be in air for the next 200 years and they've been on Earth for the last 200, mostly, signifying, uh, you know, land and property and conquering and all that more than uh, the more intellectual side. But interestingly, the one conjunction in Libra in 1980 was the the advancement of of computers, for example, which is a much more air uh, type of connection. So, yeah, you can see the potential here being enormous. But there's the duality, right? And the, you're always you're always wondering whether one side gets an advantage or maybe it's just the way it maybe the way it's the way it always is that you need both sides kind of like how you said earlier you need more than one point of view in, in terms of countries perhaps that's the same you know in within governments and within societies maybe it's inescapable yeah i i mean i i think particularly in our current times like it's just about like the nature of the times is the is the endless sort of attempts to reconcile dualities like um it's like that idea of um you know dialectics it's uh action reaction and or thesis antithesis synthesis um that's kind of how the times are made there's this just endless kind of opposition between different you know different uh polarities and then the the world is made through that that, that pressure it's hard for us to imagine it being any other way, but I suspect that is maybe the nature of these mercurial times with these Pluto-Neptune conjunctions in in Gemini. I I don't know, you know, we don't know what it felt like to be in to live in like the first millennium BC or whatever it is, or you know, whatever year you want to pick. But like, I'm not sure that it was always characterized that the world wasn't really like this. It wasn't uh, wasn't so based on dualities and oppositions and so on so yeah i think i think it's just the nature of the times we have to we have to accept it yes i agree i i totally agree totally agree and 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 yeah i mean I, for instance i'd rather see uranus and pluto in, in a trine than i would in a square um, during this period coming up even though there's always potential for things to go wrong so it's curious that, you know, following up on what you said, the conjunction of Uranus and Neptune, that's the year 93, 94. Uranus and Pluto were trining in 95, 96, 97. That was actually when I remember the internet literally exploded in terms of, uh, that was sextile, pardon me, sextile. So that was when I remember my first internet account was 95 and each year it became more and more interconnected and then it grew into the next decade and so forth but that was literally the start mid 90s of people actually having accounts and using email you know in a significant way there were some that were using it before that but it, it really grew during that sextile so perhaps the trime will be even better 
perhaps yeah i mean you have to you do have to think like these all these harmonious aspects it it it, it kind of bodes bodes well um the only the, the only other uh element that i would well there's a couple of things i would bring up that kind of maybe counterpoints as well is just that the late um the late uh, 2020s early 2030s we're gonna have uranus in gemini as you can see in this basket configuration and there has been a correlation for the united states with uranus and gemini in that the united states is kind of big transformative wars have kind of come with uranus and gemini you know have the revolutionary war when the country is born and then you have the civil war and then you have the second world war each time it's been uranus and gemini um, I don't know which chart you like to use for the United States, but in the Sibley chart, Sibley. Sibley. Gemini, yeah, Sibley chart. That's the, the, the then Gemini is the seventh whole sign house. You know, the, the house kind of you can see opposition and all the uh, opponents and so on. Yeah, um, and I, I like to use the. Um, you, you probably have come across the work of that Frenchman Gacquelin, who was he saw that when planets cross the angle even though in the conventional quadrant system, they're on the Cadence side, they're actually stronger. And that's my opinion as well from doing lots of astrology. And Uranus is the planet in the US chart that last crossed an angle, thereby stamping its its mark on, on the US. And I, I recently heard, a, well, recently, no, it's more like two or three years ago, but a, one of those podcasts with the uh, Freakonomics people, and they were saying that the best predictor of behavior is actually nationality. And they mentioned that the U.S. is an intensely individualistic country, whereas, for instance, China is intensely collective in the way they behave. And yeah, the U.S. is practically reckless Uranus, in my opinion. It, it, it's taken too far, but it's, it's a perfect fit. So to your point. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think there's no doubt, you know, the U.S. is the, the Uranian country par excellence, right? It's the country of uh, freedom and you know, it's very 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 uranian the, the interesting thing as well uh about the us if i can just show you so we looked at the pluto uh neptune conjunction here at 8 gemini um mm. 1891 and 1892 so that is a hot degree this yes. 8 gemini that's where uranus is yeah exactly i was going yeah. that's what i was going to say it's like if yeah. we if I just bring up the chart of the United States, the Sibley chart, um, you can see the interesting. So uh, if I just um, change the uh, oh, display points. <laughs> well, this is the Sibley chart. It's 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 not how you normally see it because I've got Aries as the first house and I'm right. not displaying vast planets but the point is you can see here gemini this is this is actually the seventh whole sign house of this chart mm -hmm. um and there's uranus at eight gemini right it's right at that it's at the precise degree of the pluto neptune conjunction so that really to me speaks to um the united states as kind of unique important role in this in this cycle um as a kind of uranian influence somehow as well um you know it's to me it was kind of it's really notable that it was the us that developed the atomic bomb right and and so you know that was something that was promised as part of this cycle i think with the birth of atomic physics at the conjunction it's the country with uranus at that degree um so i think you know the U us has a real special role i think um as a kind of a force of kind of um re sort of revolutionary force really i mean i think the, the big transformations of the world um have really mostly kind of come from the, the united states i think many people would argue with that um and so yes it's like the this is kind of this cycle the us is kind of very important to it um and, and also to the i think you know uranus being a planet of technology as well the kind of so much of the technology that's driving change is coming out of the, the united states yeah, you know, and it, it, there. This is where again we swing back to. I don't know if I want to call it pessimism, but lots of caution because, you know, the the Saturn, Neptune, and Aries, and then Uranus and Gemini. It just looks so much like the Civil War in the in the um, 1860s. Saturn was in Libra then, but 
it's still pretty similar because the idea is those planets, they also put pressure on the US cancer planets, those first up to 13 degrees, you know, you're squaring, it's more challenging. And so I, I don't know exactly which way it's gonna go, but I can't imagine it being completely smooth with, your, with a, a Uranus return like that to a place where it has consistently shown up as having to get through a conflict. Let's put it that way. Uh, the, on the plus side, uh, where I say disagree with people who point to these periods and say, oh, this is it, this is the end. I just say, well, no, we, we, we got into these before and we, we came out okay, it was difficult, but you know, in the end, the, the good guys mostly won you know, the, the battle. And that's my hope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the US kind of came out of all those conflicts kind of ultimately stronger, right? Um, there's no doubt about that. I don't, I don't think that it, we don't need to to go to worst case scenarios, but um, it's yeah. you know it, it, you have to reckon with that 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 is probably um, going to be a feature of the these coming years. There's something there's something there. Um, what exactly the conflict might be, it's a bit harder to say. As you say, it's kind of there's some things about it that look a bit like the civil war, um, Neptune being in Aries and so on, um, but then. Obviously, there's a lot of geopolitical tension as well, so it's a bit hard to to pick because you can kind of obviously see there's a lot of division in the the, the United States as well. Um, so that is probably a, a part of the story uh, in some sense, but you know what exactly it will be is is hard to say. So it's it's kind of if you're coming from an American perspective, it's it's kind of these different sort of things to reconcile, right? You've got Barbo saying, yes, this is the best astrology of the century. A beautiful world civilization is coming into being here. And then but then you've also got the, the knowledge of kind of what tends to happen with Uranus in Gemini. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's different things to, to reconcile. Um, there's a couple of like, and I think we also have to factor in that there could be some really weird and unexpected things that, that come in the next few years. You know, AI, for one, I think is, it's just a really unpredictable technology. I think it will have, I don't think we can imagine what effects it will have. It'll probably have, it'll probably do things to society in the world that we just didn't see coming. Like mm -hmm. really unexpected things that we, we couldn't have predicted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the printing, the printing press was the, if we look back at the last Pluto-Neptune cycle, the printing press appeared in the mid 15th century, which is the sextile of the that okay. pluto neptune cycle and it so it appeared almost at, at kind of the same time as the transistor like r relatively in the cycle so like the to what the printing press was to the last cycle the transistor is the current cycle um and you know the printing press i mean it, it's probably it's hard to hard to calculate how that affected the world um but it, obviously it's huge, it's huge. It in a huge yeah huge. i mean it, and it, yeah and it was you know it had even even um in spiritual terms it was important because it, you know it kind of drove the reformation it drove the the birth of protestantism this whole new christian faith um and that you know that had huge effects on world history and i think we'll see the si similar things with um ai and the 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 consequences of the transistor like we're it, it's not just we can look at things in a very uh, like kind of material sense, but there's also like there's sort of, there are spiritual undercurrents to things. Like technology is not just it's not just um, stuff. It's not just kind of uh, matter. Like it changes. I think it changes our how we think. It changes our spirit. So it kind of has a. It's almost. I, I do believe that um, that idea that technology itself is kind of a form of magic in a sense. You know, it, especially information technology, which is so concerned with symbols and words, like I think the way that the way that the world's going to change is it's, it's very hard to predict. But it'll be there could be you know strange consequences that we don't see coming that suddenly make all this astrology make sense. Um, <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. And you know, when you say magic, I mean, think about it. If you were, I often try, try to do these thought experiments. Imagine that you were, uh, if you were living in even 1890, but certainly a century before, and you were transported into today's world, it would take you a while to think, holy smoke, look at this, I just flip this and the light turns on and then the entire city is connected and 
that's pure magic. They'd have to think about what are they doing? And yes, there's a logic to it, but it's a pretty major infrastructure advance. And uh, technology, as we know, tends to be not so much linear. There's a, there's a, you know, the curve accelerates upon itself. It's like when they're discovering uh, CPU power, it, it, it doubles every so many years because you use the current technology to multiply your, your effect. So it, it's entirely possible that 10 years from now, we're in a really, really different world, you know, really different, where we have to adapt to all kinds of new things. Uh, yes, yeah. I think so, 100%. And if you don't mind me getting a bit weird just for a bit. Um, <laughs> you mean you haven't been weird so far? Okay. <laughs> this is, oh, no, we haven't, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm, I'm holding back quite a bit. But, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. So get get even more I've weird. Got on, which weird on. Yeah. But um, <laughs> no, I mean, the other, the other potential, I think kind of deus ex machina that, that, that might flip things in weird and unpredictable ways is also uh, the, the UFO phenomenon as well, which I mentioned dates back to the conjunctional period. It dates back to these mystery airships in the 1890s, at least the technological incarnation of it does. What was the other thing that emerged? You know, we, we looked at this sextile chart um, to just show you that again. Um, we go back to our Pluto-Neptune sextile chart. You can see it comes into orb in the 1940s. We have nuclear technology. We have the transistor. But what else do we have? We have the we have the birth of the, the sort of the modern or the the appearance of the flying saucer. Right, 1946, 47. Suddenly, see the saucers in the, even in the Second World War. There were the appearance of these strange lights that have been known as called the Foo Fighters. That's where the band gets its name. Um, you know, the, both the Allies and the Axis they were seeing these strange lights from their planes. They thought they would belong to the other side and they called them the food fires in the US. But 1947, have the flying saucer, uh, basically big, like huge numbers of flying saucer sightings. And this period of the 50s was also a real, I mean, that um, the flying saucer mythos was very strong in that period. 1952, I think we had the appearance of these discs around the, the um, Washington DC, around the Capitol and, um, and really, this whole period, as well as being the period of the Cold War, was kind of the golden age of the of ufology, of like um, belief in in flying saucers and so on. What also happened in this big dip, where I said, you know, that the Cold War kind of uh, well, it ended, and there was this period where we weren't suddenly threatened by nuclear weapons, um, at least not so much. There's also the, the UFOs kind of disappeared from the imagination a little bit nobody um i remember reading articles and people saying you know how come nobody gets abducted anymore and why does nobody <laughs> care about about ufos anymore you know it faded away right and, and it's coming it's coming back, back. you know coming like back. You, you've seen all this stuff that's happened in you know in washington with this 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 uh guy david grush this uh, supposed whistleblower who, who's claiming that the u.s has crashed craft now i don't know if that's true or not we don't we don't know but you know he said it under oath in congress this, so either it is true or there's some so it's very strange kind of intelligence operation going on that's intended to somehow make us think that things are happening that aren't happening um either way very strange things are going on in that area and um grush appeared when Pluto uh, entered Aquarius, you know, it did its little stint in Aquarius earlier this year. Pluto's going back into Aquarius next year. And I, I really expect this topic to kind of only only get more and more prominent. So, you know, I don't I don't know the realities of it. Um, I do well, believe that there's something I mean, there. Well, I tell you what, see. I mean, if you want a new world order really quickly, that's exactly what you need is that you know, the Martians land and then <laughs> everything. <laughs> Everything is completely realigned. Do I think probably not? But I, yeah, I mean, anything is possible because that would be, uh, yes, a, a total game changer. Uh, I, I don't know though with that whole, you know, the Area Fifty One, the whole thing. I, I just don't know how to grapple with it around what I know about the astronomy. It just doesn't make any sense to me on the, you know, spaceship, an actual spaceship, the way we think. A spaceship would be you know going through flying around leaving orbit entering orbit it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me but 
who knows? I mean, maybe, you know, uh, there's a race somewhere that would have an interest in coming here for some reason or other, maybe. I don't know. Well, Reserve actually, if you, if, you, um, if you get into this subject, firstly, it's a crazy hall of mirrors where, you know, you don't, you, it's hard to separate fact from fiction. There's a lot of disinformation in it. There's a lot of um, strange things going on and a lot of nonsense. But there is some kernel, I think, of like there is something real happening is happening people experience things mm -hmm. i certainly believe that um but we don't know what this thing is right there's only only the, the well-known theory is that these are kind of um coming from other planets but actually a lot there are a lot of other possibilities um that people a lot of people today are kind of thinking are even more possible maybe they come from some sort of parallel uh dimension somehow or parallel yeah. realms that makes more um, sense that makes more sense the only thing is though that if you say that then the next level is do you also have to be on that dimension? And usually that would be a consciousness dimension rather than you come from another dimension and then you appear in this physical dimension so that we can all, you know, go to the public square and see the spaceship. That's the part that is hard to to imagine. Yeah. It's always like someone has seen it somewhere, but no one can ever say, well, no, everybody saw it. Look, here's the picture at the local local shopping mall or you know something really big that's never happened like has there ever been a ufo that landed on a soccer stadium with a hundred thousand people watching no that's never happened and so uh, my feeling would be that the separate dimension is also a dimension more of consciousness than of of um you know yeah bodily matter so to speak yeah I, well i mean there have been to be fair there have been some mass sightings but nothing on the scale that you just mentioned no ufo landing in a stadium and like there have been there have definitely been sightings of uh seen by like a lot a lot of people but yeah as you say where this gets weird is that is the there are two real kind of uh elements to the phenomenon there's the kind of nuts and bolts theory which is the the idea that it's these are actual physical craft the us has maybe has them there trying to figure out how they work all that kind of stuff <laughs> that's the that's what we call nuts and bolts and then there's the consciousness aspects because there's a lot of other suggestion that this is maybe a phenomenon of consciousness or spirit that these are maybe just a new incarnation of the kind of of spiritual entities which have interacted with human beings forever and so there's what what is really slippery about the phenomenon is that it seems to do both things there are sometimes there are physical traces of of, of 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 craft there's all these claims that that they really do have um craft and so on but then there's also all this stuff kind of about psychic effects a lot of experiences uh, kind of see it more as a spiritual experience you know than a than a kind of encounter with physical entities so this is where it all gets really weird and and i think the only smart and reasonable uh position is like we don't we just don't know what's going on know. with it, yeah, what it true. really is. But what I will say, say, what I am sure about is that there is there is something. It's not just people mistaking weather balloons or, you know, all these kind of dismissive kind of explanations that have been offered in the past. There's, some, there's something happening. There is a phenomenon. And I'm sure and it's definitely correlated with this cycle. And this cycle is about is a is a cycle of consciousness. So, um where it's also it also gets messy because there's also quite clearly uh, a lot of um a lot of involvement of intelligence agencies in this area they're very concerned with it there's a lot of a lot of the figures that you uh that that are prominent in ufology as well they have intelligence connections and so on i think so it's it's really it really gets murky and messy and you know who knows what's going on but uh, another possibility is that it, it there's some kind of new belief system or new faith kind of coming into being around this and some and parties are trying to manipulate that they want um they they want to stay somewhat in control of what people believe about this uh phenomenon because you know it will have very un could have very unpredictable consequences <laughs> yeah <laughs> you can say that again yeah no i mean <laughs> that's that's the whole thing that you can understand why this is why it there's a big question mark. You could understand why, if there were something, why a government would be very reluctant to let that out, given the tremendous, tremendous upheaval that you could, you could, uh, you could promote. You know, you could make happen. So yes, it makes perfect sense. It's just the, uh, I, I, I'm still working on trying to understand the, you know, the notion of 
of space travel on a physical level, how incredibly difficult it is to do without getting into things like wormholes and you know, or things like uh, you know, Star Trek will just be me down type thing. Stuff that's so beyond our comprehension that it doesn't feel like it's gonna happen anytime soon. So it's difficult to understand how that would work, but I, I remain open. I mean, anything is possible. And, and I, I would rather have trines and sextiles, put it that way. If I saw everything square, everything, then I'd say, they're gonna, they're gonna land, they're gonna conquer us. It's gonna be like that, uh, that show in the 80s where they landed and then they were eating the people, you know, they were using them for food. That would be uh, <laughs> you know, multiple squares and oppositions and, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, all my, <laughs> yeah, I, I see. Well, what can you say? I mean, I think it's, um, I think it is a part of the the um, the kind of complex brew of the times. It's something. It's it's a part of the story of the next few years, in my opinion. I think we'll hear a lot more about it. What it really is, where it really leads, uh, who knows? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we'll find out. I mean, that part. There's no question. I mean, there's, there are so many cycles that go along with these as well that you have to factor in like neptune has been in pisces since 2011 it's going to get out into aries and on the one hand that could be all the issues that it will deal with being in aries being next to saturn and all of that but i noticed neptune and pisces the duality of pisces both because it's a dual sign but also the duality of any planet i, I understand planets have a like a range they function really well or really poorly neptune on the high end it's a very spiritual planet and the explosion in spiritual information availability in the last decade has been phenomenal. It's been wonderful on video I and mean, you can find everything. I used to go to the occult shop, you know, and find the book somewhere with some mention or something. Now you find it in a video in different ways. But at the same time, disinformation, the other side of that, it's grown tremendously as well in the last decade to the point where, you know, fake news, who knows what's true. Neptune is getting out of Pisces. We have to see what that does. That's one example of a pretty major switch. And then there's Pluto moving from a governmental sign, Capricorn, into Aquarius, which to my mind, uh, Aquarius is a more uh, you know, people sign. It's, it doesn't align well with, with uh, fascistic impulses. That's why Pluto in Cancer was more suitable for that when we had the rise of fascism in the, in the 30s. That's the opposite sign. So Cancer Capricorn to me are prone to that those type of movements. And those two alone just getting out is, is really significant, even if you don't tie them to anything, putting them in new signs. And so we're getting these different movements, but we're getting Neptune changing signs, Saturn changing signs, and Uranus changing signs as well, right? So that's a lot. That's a lot of uh, planetary energy shifting. It is, yeah, yeah, and so that's that's the the next uh, couple of years, two or three years is going to be kind of interesting. When you've got all those outer planets right at the end of the signs, and you know, in the last degrees, um, does look kind of kind of volatile. Might be a, an interesting ride. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, you, one of the, you, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll I was just going to say one of the um, one of the possibility that that kind of strikes me that I'm kind of thinking a little bit about is, um, you know, what if we get kind of get everything we want and we get this sort of, <laughs> yeah, and we get this, we get peace and we get like an, an AI, it, um, the technology advances so much that um, we're sort of able to say, plug into amazing virtual worlds and kind of, uh, we get into a realm of post scarcity and all that kind of stuff that the you know the AI proponents uh, they you know they they like to claim, um, you know it seems unrealistic. But let's just say that I mean I think one risk with this technology is that it 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 might be almost too good in the sense that we're here to, in my opinion, like I my belief is that we're here to uh, to learn lessons to grow spiritually. You know I think I don't know how you can do astrology and not kind of come to some sort of perspective like that and so what if we're able to just create realities using this technology which uh almost just we stop growing because of them because uh you know you can already see it a little bit with phones um people are when they're when they're on when they're sort of stuck on their phones they're not bored because they've got endless stimulation right but they're not really you're not really growing are you you're just kind of like 
sort of it's almost like you're taking a drug that's kind of uh, keeping you a little bit entertained but you're not really you're not truly living and that's a little bit my worry that like things go well but then the 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 real um the next uh challenge is a spiritual one in terms of like how do we um do is this technology good for us and and do we really need it and does it enable spiritual and human flourishing in in a sort of the profound way that we'd probably want yeah well that, and that you're almost pointing to that's like saying it's now the iphone and you're pointing to the super 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 duper iphone right where it's so good that everyone is totally addicted to the to the uh technology but then see there you get into something different you know wisdom itself which would be that anything you keep your mind on is ultimately that's not the truth this is like how people will say well i had a great experience i saw whatever some great vision well yeah but that's what you saw then now you're here so you have to let go of that vision there is no experience that truly can do it for you you have to let them all go that's the more true spirituality so maybe that has to be taught and informed and brought into the world more or simultaneous with the increase in these you know in these ideas it's it's, it's a little bit like uh now everyone in a way is all stressed out and you see a huge industry and in helping people to de-stress because it's being identified. You know, people say, look, this is affecting your dopamine levels. You're staring at your phone. Then you create a dopamine circuit. That's not good because of ABCD, change it to this other thing. And so in a way you might even say that the final or one of the final conclusions to all this is that when all is said and done, you know, that how you said something about earlier, I caught you in a way pointing indirectly to that Pareto principle where, you know, that uh, mathematician that discovered that uh, the 80, 20 rule that 20% of the people own 80% of the wealth, or that even we wear 20% of the, how, how does it work? 80% of the time we wear 20% of our clothes. It's this thing where things just uh, move in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain way so that only a certain number of people can figure it out. Maybe in every, uh, every civilization, some people will get it and some people won't. You know, in other words, we get this period coming up Maybe you could even go back to all the periods, go back to the 1940s. Some people were thriving and some were not. Overall, the world was in a terrible place, but lots of people got by. Recent pandemic, many people did phenomenally well. Many people did not. And so in a way, it, it's up to the individual to discover and you know how do you align with these movements to get the best result for yourself. And then there'll be many that will be that way and many that won't because it'd be a pretty sad world if you know what you say is true. So. We get AI and now I, I hope that I don't spend my entire day, you know, uh, surfing the al alternative world and I'm, <laughs> that's all it is. I hope not. I mean, I guess I'm open to anything, but how do you feel about that based on what you know so far about your life? Well, I would, you know, I would like to think that I'd have the spiritual wisdom not to do that. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I let's be, I mean, I'll be honest, you know, I spend too much time on my phone as it is and, you um, I, you know, I've, I've, I've um, played a lot of video games in my time and all that kind of stuff. You know, I don't spend a lot, of time, I don't spend much time doing that now, but um, it, I, I would not be too surprised if I was pretty tempted by these things because they're, they're going to make these technologies as entertaining as possible and um, they're going to be very powerful. And you can imagine that um, future sort of virtual technologies are going to be able to just plunge us into quite amazing immersive worlds where we can interact with people um that where it's much more you know we're just the way we're talking now over zoom it, what they're aiming for is kind of the ability to interact with people as if it feels real and i don't think it'll ever maybe feel 100 percent real but it's going to get very good and um i think like one of the uh main themes of this cycle i've kind of in one of my videos i really framed it as kind of spirit and science um because if you look back to this big can this big cycle this pluto neptune cycle 1890s and so on we have this explosion of uh of technology but we also have a kind of uh a new way to relate to spirit and i i think ultimately this big cycle maybe what it's really about is is kind of um reconciling technology and spirituality 
Um, and I think there's going to be like, yeah, temptations to do it the wrong way. Um, and yeah, it's something we're all going to have to wrestle with probably uh, eventually. Um, and I, I think it's important to be, to uh, to know know thyself basically to be correct, very self-aware. Correct. Yeah, that's the thing that if you if you talk about, for instance, great uh, technology around biofeedback, uh, helping you to, for example, more effectively access the types of energies that great Buddhist monks access, or you know that kind of thing. That's great. It's what you're talking about around the danger would be the unreality, the you know the delusional side where you're lost in the in a, a kind of joint space where you're not even developing anymore. Well, first of all, in your chart, your Saturn Neptune, Saturn Neptune square will protect you, so you don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> you're going to be fine. Saturn will scream. If you start to, you know, really go off the rails, it'll say, come back to reality. I mean, the thing about Saturn is that aside from all the, all the problems it may bring about, and it brings about plenty, it is the most realistic planet. Uh, one of my theories is that it's it's a foundation of all religions you know through the the focus uh discipline uh, energy you need to apply in order to give birth to planets like jupiter neptune you know any planet needs the saturn um you know channel and if you've got it actually in your case it's a t-square so even more even more to the point that neptune right maybe i'm saying too much is it is it bad to to, uh, no, it's <laughs> it's fine. I don't I don't mind you t telling people I've got a Saturn Neptune square. No, I feel I feel grateful for that. Honestly, I've, I've there's been a lot of times when I've uh, been able to to kind of um, pull back from the brink of kind of going too far in various Neptunian ways. Um, there is a, there's always a point where part of me will say say no, let's get it together and you know um, let's not cross the cross the line. Let's stay grounded. Well, I think oh, that's... Yeah, you're, you're using it brilliantly. You're using it from what you're doing with, with these cycles and with your connection to astrology. That's that's a brilliant use of Saturn, Neptune. You know, there's a tension there, but there's a constant, you know, trying to grapple with it, organize it, keep it keep it together. It's it's great. It's great. It's uh, it, I, you, Yours would be, at least on that level, there could be other things that I don't know about, but just on this, uh, you're doing phenomenally well. Venus, Neptune... You know with saturn in the middle and saturn also is is connected to capricorn and the historical the past it rules time so the idea of of looking back to see what happened and then what is projected forward is very saturnian as well so and then in virgo very analytical obviously lots of detail which you certainly <laughs> are displaying in spades good for you it's really good really excellent i think you're very good <laughs> thank you andre so I guess we should leave it at, at, at that for this, but I look forward to future talks because I think, uh, I think we, could, we could explore some interesting topics, especially if, you, if you'd like to talk about maybe things that are going on in the, at any point in the current world and if you, to relate them to prior points because you'll probably have access to that information, right? Yeah, I'd be very yeah. glad to. No, it's, been a, it's been a fun conversation. Really enjoyed it. Likewise, definitely, yes. All right, well, uh, we'll stop there and we'll say goodbye to everyone for now. Thanks so much to Andre for hosting the conversation. Please do check out his channel. The details are in the description below. And if you found this, and if you found this video interesting, then I suggest you watch this video, which is the first in a series of videos I made last year with SJ Anderson on the astrology of the 2020s. Thanks and see you next time.